Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. While NASA continues to work on a nuclear thermal drive that will get us to Mars in half the time, or perhaps even a quarter of the time, there are other engineers and scientists working on something called a magnetic plasma drive that can give us 18 times the performance of what NASA is working on right now. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. Got a couple of changes uh, that are taking place here on the channel. Want to make sure that all of my viewers are aware of this. However, if it's uh, the details of the operation of this channel are not all that interesting to you, just go ahead and skip to here. Um, as many of you may have noticed, I put out daily content on this channel, or close to it, and I'm just not going to be able to manage that anymore. Not full-fledged videos as I've been doing in the past. It's just killing me. Um, it's As many of you probably know, um, I don't have any script writer or anything. I actually ad-lib most of my videos. I don't write much of anything down. Um, that comes from my experience as a stage actor. Um, being able to ad-lib things is something that I learned how to do, and it seems to have worked out fairly well on this channel. Um, and also, I do all my own editing, that sort of thing, and so frankly, it's just taking me apart. So, as a result, I am still going to be releasing close to daily content, but on the off days, I'm going to be releasing a series that I am currently calling Angry Clips. I find all kinds of fascinating spaceflight related clips from all over the internet all the time. Yesterday you may have noticed that I rolled one out in regards to uh, Artemis re-entering the atmosphere. I'm going to continue doing that. Um, find some unusual ones, rare clips, things you may not have seen before, and I'm going to be rolling those out. That'll be three times a week for regular viewers, six times a week for Discord supporters, Patreon folks, that sort of thing. Um, so I hope you guys enjoy that. The reason I'm going to have to continue rolling out content on a daily basis, well, for one thing, I certainly want to continue giving you guys as much content as I can. I don't want you guys to have to scale back on what you're getting from me, but at the same time, it's the way YouTube is handling my videos. The YouTube algorithm has decided, as you can see from this graph, that after 24 hours, my videos are just not popular anymore. And so the algorithm just stops promoting them. It doesn't matter how incredibly popular the video is in the first 24 hours, they just stop promoting it. And I've noticed this most keenly with one of my recent videos on the Tic Tac UFOs. My God, that was so popular. It piled up insane numbers of views in the first 24 hours. In 48 hours, it was pulling the same meager, pathetic number of views that some of my most unpopular videos pull. And there's only one reason for that. The YouTube algorithm and YouTube just stops promoting it because for some reason, some formula has decided that my videos are just not popular after 24 hours. This is an issue that I've tried to address with YouTube customer service. And here's how these conversations usually go. Hey, look, I, I noticed that I had a video doing just really, really well, insanely well. And yet, you know, according to the numbers, people are still clicking on it really often, you know, if they get a chance to see it. But you're, you're just not promoting it anymore. How can a video drop off by 95% in 24 hours? It just doesn't make any sense. YouTube customer service cannot discuss any details regarding the YouTube algorithm. Well, yeah, I understand that, but I mean, surely there's got to be something we can do because you guys are losing money just like I do if you stop promoting a popular video. YouTube customer service cannot discuss any details regarding the YouTube algorithm. Am I talking to a real person or chat GPT? <laughs> so anyway, hopefully at some point I'll be able to get this resolved, but in the meantime, this is my solution. I hope you guys enjoy it, and thank you very much for watching. Let's get on to the topic at hand, to plasma propulsion. 
So you guys have probably heard me talk about things that are similar to this on this channel a number of times. Pulsar Fusion, for example, even though they talk about using a fusion drive, that they're creating fusion propulsion, really a lot of what they're doing is very similar to a plasma propulsion system. Okay, so what's the difference there? Well, it mostly comes in the form of how you're getting your thrust. Now, a fusion drive is actually using the energy generated by a fusion reaction in order to generate thrust in some way. And that's something that's a long ways off simply because we are a long way from creating a functional fusion reactor that actually produces a lot of energy and then we'll have to put that reactor into space. But another way to get propulsion is to use a fission reaction that in turn creates a fusion reaction and in the process of doing that you create something called a high energy ionized plasma. There's a variety of ways to create this ionized plasma, but the cool thing about it, even though you may not be getting any energy off of it simply because it takes as much energy to create it as you're getting out of it, it is an ionized high energy, super hot substance that if you can direct it out the nozzle of a rocket delivers insane amounts of thrust. We're talking dozens of times more thrust than a chemical rocket and even far better than the nuclear thermal propulsion that NASA is working on right now. This is an engine known as the Vasimir, or the Variable Specific Impulse Magnetoplasma Rocket, something that I've reported on a number of times on this channel, and something that a company called Ad Astra has been working on for a very long period of time. The concept that they're working on is pretty similar to a lot of other different plasma engine designs. By the way, all of these amazing images you're seeing right now is coming to you from a channel called Asteronics, which deals almost exclusively with next generation propulsion systems, including faster than light travel. Wonderful channel, and not a whole lot of people have been watching lately, so please head on over there, subscribe, and check out the amazing work that they do. But here's the difference between a plasma drive and a nuclear engine, or a chemical engine for that matter. Let's talk about chemical propulsion first. This is, of course, the main mainstay for all current spacecraft. It has a tremendous amount of thrust, as we know from just watching the Starship take off and those 33 Raptor engines going. That is a colossal amount of thrust, but a very limited specific impulse. We're talking just over 300 seconds, and this thing is out of gas. If you want to travel between the planets, or especially between the stars, you absolutely need a higher specific impulse than that. However, ion engines, which are used for a lot of different interplanetary probes and satellites, that sort of thing, well, they have a really high specific impulse. It takes a lot of time for them to run through their propellant. They're a lot more efficient than chemical engines, but not a lot of thrust because they utilize solar power to ionize a propellant that is fairly easy to ionize, like argon, for example, in the case of this particular ion thruster being tested by Pulsar Fusion. However, you can only ionize so much of the propellant at a time with a limited amount of solar energy, so you're not getting a lot of thrust. Not a lot at all. An engine like this is generating about the same amount of thrust as you would get by putting a piece of paper on your spacecraft about that much weight. It's a constant level of acceleration, which means over time, you are going to build up a substantial amount of velocity, especially if your spacecraft doesn't weigh that much, but that still doesn't work out very well for a heavy human-rated spacecraft. So how do you get 
superior ISP, but a large amount of thrust at the same time? Well, NASA's solution right now, and the easiest way to do this is through something called nuclear thermal propulsion. You're using a fission reactor in order to generate a tremendous amount of heat, and you pass a propellant, which is commonly hydrogen, through the reactor core, where it gets heated to very high temperatures by the thermal energy from the fission reaction. The heated propellant then expands and is expelled through a nozzle, producing thrust in a manner similar similar to a chemical rocket, except that propellant is traveling much faster because it's superheated by the nuclear reaction. So you're getting a large amount of thrust or for a longer period of time because this engine is substantially more efficient. However, you're only talking about two to three times as efficient as a conventional chemical engine. Can we do better than that? Well, yes, we absolutely can. The magnetic fusion plasma drive, which is called a wide variety of things by a wide variety of companies, is probably the most practical way with current technology that we can generate a lot more thrust and a lot more ISP for a human rated spacecraft. So let's see how this works. Now, in order to get plasma, you first need fusion. Now, we're not talking about a fusion reactor here. We're just talking about a fusion reaction, similar to the fusion reaction that is involved with the thermonuclear bomb. Now, in order to get the heat necessary in order to create a fusion reaction, you usually need a fission reaction in the amount of heat that that produces, that then fuses elements like helium and deuterium into new elements elements and in the process of fusing them you have an enormous amount of energy released and an enormous amount of high energy plasma created. This stuff is insanely hot. We're talking millions of degrees Celsius. It's however ionized and it contains so much energy that if it can be directed out the nozzle of a rocket you're looking at enormous amounts of thrust and ISP from the same substance. Now, incidentally, once your plasma is this hot, it will convert just about any substance into more ionized plasma, which means you can chuck in metals like aluminum or even things like iron into a reaction like this, and it too will become ionized plasma. Heavy ionized plasma, which could also work out really well as propellant for a magnetoplasma rocket. This this, by the way, plasma is called the fourth state of matter. You have gas, you have liquid, you have solid, and then you have plasma as the fourth state of matter. Not to say that that's actually true, but it is a unique state, a high energy state where matter is on the verge of being converted into pure energy. Now, this is a very difficult thing to control. Obviously, if you have a substance that's millions of degrees Celsius, how the hell are you going to keep it from destroying your engine? Well, by means of a series of electromagnets. This is something called a tokamak configuration, and it may be familiar to you because this is what Pulsar Fusion intends to use. It's a donut-shaped configuration combining external magnetic coils and a current within the plasma in order to create a strong confining magnetic field. If you can confine and control the plasma, with a high degree of precision, you can not only keep it from damaging your engine, you can also direct it out the magnetic nozzle of the rocket with a high degree of precision and a hell of a lot of thrust and ISP. On top of that, you sometimes need radiation shielding because a reaction produced by deuterium and tritium, which is the more conventional and easier to make type of fusion reaction because helium-3 is hard to come by, well, that type of reaction produces a lot of neutron radiation, so you're going to need some sort of neutron shielding. 
Again, unless you can find a lot of helium-3, then that eliminates a lot of the radiation in the reaction. So once you have harnessed this plasma thrust, you get a combination of massive ISP and massive thrust in the same engine. So what kind of capabilities are we looking at here? Well, even if we assume a fairly modest acceleration for the entire journey to Mars, for example, we're talking only 1% of 1G acceleration for the entire trip. You can make the trip in five days. Let me say that again. With only 1% of 1G or 1 100th of 1G acceleration sustained over the entire journey, you can get to Mars in a mere five days. And the reason you're able to sustain that level of acceleration over that entire time is because you don't have to use as much fuel in order to create the same amount of thrust. If your propellant is leaving the nozzle at 200 kilometers per second, for example, as opposed to 4.5 kilometers per second for a chemical rocket, that means you are using less than 1 20th of the fuel that's required in order to get the same thrust with a chemical rocket. As long as you can get enough thrust out of that kind of solution to generate that kind of acceleration, that 1% of 1G or whatever, then you're going to get the results that we're talking about here. At the very least, you're talking about Earth to Mars in a couple of weeks instead of a month and a half or three months or six months with chemical rockets. By the way, the Vasimir engine that you're looking at right now, it creates plasma by means of high energy radio waves and doesn't necessarily need the heat of a fission reaction in order to create the same kinds of plasma, but the principle is essentially the same. And of course, another massive benefit to this solution is the fact that the reaction generates a considerable amount of energy, which the ship can use for other electrical purposes. So it can run all the computers, all of the labs, all the life support, everything that's necessary for the ship to function off of the same engine, which means you don't need massive solar panels and that sort of thing for your ship, which reduces weight considerably as well. You do, however, need heat radiators in some cases in order to dissipate all of this massive heat so it doesn't damage your ship, but nevertheless, if we can find a way to magnetically confine and control plasma efficiently, that is the only thing that needs to be done. And it's actually easier to do that in space than it is to do here on Earth because of the lack of atmosphere and the microgravity environment. The lack of atmosphere is the biggest issue because you have to do this in a vacuum. It requires perhaps one third of the total amount of energy that you have to put into a fusion reactor just to pump out the air. Creating large vacuum Vacuum environments is actually one of the biggest challenges that fusion reactor engineers have to deal with these days. And if you're doing it in space, that's a challenge you don't have to deal with at all. This is most probably the best way at least as far as our current technology is concerned, to drive payload and passengers from here to Mars or here to the outer planets in a very reasonable amount of time. A time frame that makes everything we've been discussing with Mars missions up to this point seem silly by comparison. Five days instead of six months, or if you're going out to the outer planets, perhaps two or three months instead of three or four years. This brings the entire solar system within our grasp. Although interstellar travel is a lot more challenging with this kind of solution simply because plasma is traveling at about 200 kilometers per second at best when it leaves the nozzle and if you want to travel at relativistic speeds you need thousands of kilometers per second not hundreds but nevertheless this is a breakthrough type of propulsion that many labs are working on right now all over the planet including two labs 
labs right here in my immediate area in Milton Keynes. All of this could revolutionize not only space travel, but our ability to colonize the solar system. Thank you very much for watching. Please like and please subscribe. It's very important to the future of my channel. And also please consider joining the dozens of people who have chosen to support me on Patreon in the last few months. It makes a huge difference to my ability to continue creating this content. And as always, guys, stay angry about space.